Let's begin with a thought experiment. This is a rocket ship. So this rocket ship is in outer space and is far from any mass of bodies. So the space-time is flat and the laws of special relativity hold. Now notice the rocket engines are not firing, so the rocket is not accelerating, and in fact the rocket is at rest in an inertial frame. Now we use a laser to produce a pulse of light that travels from the left side of the rocket to the right side of the rocket. So here's the pulse of light when it's first released from the laser. Here it is when it's about halfway across, and here it is where, when it reaches the right side of the rocket. And because the laws of special relativity hold, we know the light will travel in a straight line. And we can verify that the light traveled in a straight line by imagining the light to graze the back of the rocket ship and leave scorch marks along the back of the rocket ship. And so after the fact, we can go and examine the path that the light took, and we can see that it's indeed a straight line. Now let's consider how this same light pulse appears to observers in a second rocket ship that's accelerating relative to the first rocket ship, relative to this inertial frame. So we'll imagine the second rocket ship is accelerating upward, and at the moment that the light is released from the laser, the second rocket ship is in the same location as the first rocket ship and momentarily at rest. So in order to keep this picture from becoming too cluttered, let me erase the first rocket ship. and now draw the second rocket ship. So this is the second rocket ship at the moment that the photon is released. And now remember this rocket ship is accelerating upward, so I'll show the engines as firing. Keep in mind, this is the picture of the second rocket ship at the moment when the light pulse is released when the light pulse is on the left side here. By the time the pulse of light reaches the midpoint, this second rocket ship has moved up a little bit since it's accelerating upward. So let me draw the floor of the rocket ship as moved up a little bit. And here, the rocket engines, I won't bother to draw the exhaust smoke. And the nose of the rocket has also moved up a bit, to say right here. So this is the picture of the rocket at the moment the light pulse has reached the middle. And by the time the light pulse reaches the right side, the floor will have moved up to, say, right here. Here are again the engines, and I won't draw the smoke. And here's the nose of the spaceship. When the light pulse reaches the right side. Of course, you'll notice that the distance the rocket has traveled between this second and third picture is larger than the distance it traveled between the first and second picture, that's because this rocket is accelerating upward. Now we can combine these three separate pictures into a single picture of our rocket ship. There's the floor. This is the nose of the rocket ship. Here are the engines, the exhaust smoke. Now when the light pulse is first released, it's on the left side of the ship, about right here. When the light pulse reaches the midway point, it's shifted down a little bit relative to this rocket ship, say right here, and when the light pulse reaches the right side, it's almost all the way to the floor right here. So as you can see, for the observers on this second rocket ship, the light pulse follows a curved path, and we can verify that the path really is curved by imagining that the light pulse grazes the back of the rocket ship and leaves scorch marks along the back of the rocket ship. These scorch marks then give us a record of the light's path and we can see that it's indeed curved. Now we know the path that light takes as seen by a non-inertial observer in empty space. But we also know from the principle of equivalence that this observer can't tell by any local measurements the difference between accelerating in empty space and hovering above a body of mass M. 
In both cases, the observer experiences an acceleration and sees the light as traveling along a curved path. This thought experiment gives us our first hint that light is bent or deflected by a massive body. But to be honest, I'm not completely comfortable with this thought experiment. It seems to raise a number of questions. For example, we use the principle of equivalence, which requires only local measurements, but our light pulse has to travel all the way across the rocket ship. So is this local? The analysis also seems to suggest that only a stationary observer will see the light as being bent. What about an observer who is in free fall? Is there any objective sense in which the light bends? These are some subtle issues that I would like to discuss, but I think it's best if we wait until the end of the lecture to do so. So for now, we'll just take this thought experiment as a hint or a suggestion that the path of light can be affected by a gravitational field. So for now, let's turn to the main goal of this lecture, which is to compute the deflection of light around a massive body M. So for example, this might be the sun. You have a star. And here's Earth. And the light is deflected as it passes nearby the Sun. The light, of course, follows a null geodesic in the Schwarzschild geometry. So here I've written the Schwarzschild geodesics. And as in uh, previous cases, we'll consider the motion to take place in the equatorial plane. So we'll set theta equal to pi over 2. So that means this term and this term are 0. This, term, this uh, equation is just 0 equals 0. And we're dealing with the null case. So that's the case where this first integral equals 0 on the right-hand side. And finally, also, this term is 0. Now, just like the case of orbital motion of the planets, we have two killing vector fields. One is d by dt, and that gives rise to the first integral t dot equals some constant, which we'll call little e, like we did in the case of orbital motion of the planets, divided by 1 minus 2m over r. And another killing vector field is d by d phi, and that gives rise to the first integral phi dot equals some constant little l divided by r squared. So we have three first integrals of these three geodesic equations. So we can now dispense with these and just work with the first integral equations. The first step will be to use these expressions for t dot and phi dot in this first integral. And of course, theta dot is 0 and sine squared theta is just 1. So this equation becomes minus 1 minus 2m over r times e squared over 1 minus 2m over r quantity squared plus r dot squared divided by 1 minus 2m over r plus r squared times phi dot squared, but phi dot squared is l squared over r to the fourth, so this is l squared over r squared, and that's all equal to zero. So let's put these two terms together. We have r dot squared minus e squared both divided by 1 minus 2m over r. Let's multiply through by 1 minus 2m over r. We have L squared over r squared times 1 minus 2m over r equals 0. Now finally, let's move the e squared to the right-hand side and multiply through by 1 half. So we have 1 half r dot squared plus L squared over 2r squared times 1 minus 2m over r equals e squared over 2. Written this way, you see that the radial motion of the light, or the photon, can be treated as a point particle 
with mass equal to 1 and total energy e squared over 2 moving in this effective potential. So let's call that effective potential W effective. It's L squared over 2 R squared minus ML squared over R cubed. The energy diagram for this effective particle looks like this. This is the R axis, this is energy, and the effective potential for large R, this term is negligible, so this just looks like a 1 over R squared kind of curve. But as R becomes smaller, this term becomes more important. And when R is very small, this term dominates with the minus sign. That means the curve plunges to minus infinity for very small R. So this is the W effective curve. And you can check that the peak of this curve occurs at aerial radius 3m. Right? But the surface of the sun is actually in here somewhere. So this would be the surface of the sun. And remember, everything at smaller aerial radius, um, this is not relevant in the sense that the inside the surface of the sun, the geometry is something different than Schwarzschild. Right, so the photon is described by this effective particle with total energy e squared over 2. So e squared over 2 would be about here on this diagram. So this describes the effective particle as moving in from infinity, reflecting off the potential, and then moving back out to infinity. Notice if the effective energy e squared over 2 is much larger than this, then the photon just comes in and hits the surface of the sun. So this would be a photon with a large e squared over 2 coming in from infinity and hitting the surface of the sun. Remember our goal is to determine how light is deflected as it passes by the sun. So what we really need to know is how the angle phi changes as the light pulse comes from infinity into the point of closest approach and then moves back out to infinity. So we really would like to know phi as a function of r. And to determine that, we'll write down d phi dr as a differential equation. This is phi dot divided by r dot. And remember, phi dot is just L over r squared. And r dot, we can compute from here. We just bring this term to the right-hand side, multiply through by 2, and then take the square root. So the result of this calculation is d phi dr equals plus or minus from taking the square root l over r squared times the quantity e squared minus l squared times 1 minus 2m over r divided by r squared all to the minus 1 half power. So we can integrate this equation, and we'll do that in a minute. But first I want to draw a careful picture showing just what's going on. The picture I draw will show a t equal constant slice of short shield geometry. And we'll also look in the equatorial plane defined by theta equal pi over 2. So here's the central mass, m. Recall that in the Schwarzschild geometry, space is strongly curved near the massive body, but far away it becomes nearly flat. So beyond some aerial radius, which I've depicted by this circle, the space out here is nearly flat. And we can use that fact to set up a nearly Cartesian coordinate system. So let me draw the coordinate lines out here in this region. This is sometimes referred to as the asymptotically flat region.
So this is really just a Cartesian coordinate system with a hole in it. So this Cartesian coordinate grid, or nearly Cartesian coordinate grid, covers the asymptotically flat region of space. where space is nearly flat. Now let's take a laser and shine light into this interior region. Now let's draw a radial line that's parallel to this light pulse. So uh, notice, because space is spherically symmetric, the notion of a radial line is well defined. It's just a theta equal constant, phi equal constant line that goes straight out. So this is a radial line that's parallel to the initial direction of the light. And because we're in the asymptotically flat region, the notion of parallel is well defined. So now let's also pick this grid line to be the x-axis. So the Schwarzschild coordinate phi is measured from this axis. So the, the initial location of the light pulse has an angle phi that's defined by this arc length. So we'll call this angle phi sub i, the i for initial, phi sub initial. And notice that this angle can be measured without ever looking inside the interior region. It can be measured entirely in this asymptotically flat region. An observer just needs to find this arc length and then the circumference of this circle. And then the ratio of those two distances is the angle phi sub i. And likewise, we can define the angle between this radial line and the x-axis. Let's call that sigma. So this is the angle sigma. And just like phi, it can be defined entirely by measurements in this asymptotically flat region, just as the ratio of the, this arc length to the circumference. It's actually important that we're able to define these angles without any reference to the interior region of the space because eventually we'll want to apply our results to exotic space-times like space-times with a black hole. And in that case, the radial lines actually cross at a finite aerial radius. What do we expect to happen to this pulse of light? Well, if this were Newtonian physics, we would just expect it to go straight through and come out the other side, and we can construct where it comes out in the following way. So let's first extend this radial line to the other side by moving through an angle of pi around in this asymptotically flat region. And now this is the extension of that radial line. And where the light comes out should be shifted upwards from that radial line by a certain angle, which is just equal to this angle. It's just phi i minus sigma. So if this is the angle phi i minus sigma, then the light should come up parallel to this radial line at that location. So this is the Newtonian result. And the exit angle for this pulse of light, we'll call that phi final. That's it's always, phi is measured from the x-axis, so it's sigma plus pi minus this angle. So that's sigma plus pi minus phi i minus sigma, which simplifies to pi plus 2 sigma minus phi i. So that's the Newtonian result. 
but of course it's incorrect. What actually happens is the light pulse is deflected by the presence of this mass and comes out at some other angle which we'll call phi final. Of course the result is going to depend on how much the initial pulse is displaced away from this radial line. So we'll define this separation, call it B. B is the impact parameter. Now keep in mind that this whole analysis depends on the assumption that this asymptotically flat region is flat or very nearly flat, and that's only true in the limit as this circle goes to infinity. So if we imagine this region separating the interior from the asymptotically flat exterior, if we imagine that circle increasing in size or circumference to infinity while keeping the impact parameter constant, you'll notice that the arc length between this radial line and the initial location of light pulse, that arc length is just the impact parameter, and that becomes a smaller and smaller fraction of the total circumference as we let this circle go to infinity. So that means this angle goes to zero, which is to say that phi i becomes approximately sigma in the limit as we let this circle go to infinity. So in the end of the calculations, we're going to let phi i go to sigma. So this Newtonian result, notice if I set phi i equal to sigma, the final angle becomes pi plus sigma. We're almost ready to carry out the calculation of this final angle phi sub f, but there's one more relationship that we need. The impact parameter b is approximately equal to this arc length. In fact, in the limit as this circle goes to infinity, b is precisely equal to this arc length. So b is equal to the aerial radius, at this point let's call the aerial radius r sub i, times this angle which is phi sub i minus sigma. Now r sub i and phi sub i correspond to the Schwarzschild coordinates of this point, the initial position of the light pulse, but we could have just as easily drawn the this circle a little bit larger and chosen the initial position of the light pulse here, or say here. So really, this relationship between r and phi holds all along the path of the light. So we can drop these subscripts i and just write b equals r times phi minus sigma, which holds for all the r and phi values in this asymptotically flat region. So we have b over r equals phi minus sigma in the asymptotically flat region. And now differentiating this with respect to the affine parameter lambda, we have minus b over r squared times r dot is equal to phi dot. So we can rewrite this as d phi dr, that's of course phi dot over r dot, is equal to minus b over r squared. Now this result holds in the asymptotically flat region, but we can compare it to our general result that holds everywhere, namely d phi dr equals plus or minus l over r squared times e squared minus l squared times 1 minus 2m over r divided by r squared to the minus one-half power. Now in the asymptotically flat region r is very large so these terms are negligible so we'll set those equal to zero. Also we're considering the part of the light pulse path where it's just entering the central region moving towards the mass so the angle phi is increasing as r is decreasing so we should choose the minus sign here the plus sign would correspond to the part of the motion where the light pulse is moving away from the central mass. The angle phi is still increasing as r increases. So choosing the minus sign here 
and setting these terms equal to zero in order to compare this result with this result, we find minus b over r squared equals minus l over r squared, and from this term to the minus one half we have absolute value of e. So this can be rewritten as absolute value of e is equal to l over b. We can now use this result to write d phi dr in terms of the impact parameter b. So notice that l here, we have a factor of l squared in both of these terms, then to the minus one half power, that l will cancel this l. So the result is d phi dr equals minus, I'll use the minus sign corresponding to the light pulse moving towards the central mass, 1 over r squared times 1 divided by square root of 1 over b squared minus 1 minus 2m over r divided by r squared. We can solve this differential equation using separation of variables. So let's write this as d phi equals minus dr divided by r squared times the square root of 1 over b squared minus 1 minus 2m over r divided by r squared. And now we can integrate. What we would like is the change in angle as the pulse of light moves from infinity in towards the central mass and then back out to infinity again. And on the outward part of that trip, we would have to change this minus sign to a plus sign. Alternatively, we can integrate this from infinity into the inner turning point. Let's call it R plus. That's the point where the pulse of light is closest to the central mass. And we can just then double this to get the total angle. So by symmetry, the angle through which the pulse of light turns as it moves in from infinity to the inner turning point is the same as the change in angle as it moves from the inner turning point back out to infinity. So this is the change in angle, which was denoted phi final minus phi initial in the picture that I drew earlier. Now, the calculation of this integral is very similar to the calculation we did for orbital motion in short shield. In fact, you'll notice that what's under the square root is proportional to the energy which in this case is e squared over 2 minus the effective potential. In fact, the, the proportionality constant is just 2 over L squared. And remember, the effective potential is L squared over 2 R squared times 1 minus 2 M over R. So this is a cubic polynomial. It's cubic in 1 over R, and the roots of the polynomial here are just can be analyzed by the energy diagram. So let's remind ourselves of what that diagram looks like. So this is the R axis. This is the energy axis. And the effective potential looks like this. All right, so this is W effective. And the energy of the effective particle is perhaps right here. So the pulse of light comes in from infinity, reflects off the potential, and moves back out to infinity. So this point of closest approach is the root that we're calling r plus here in the integral. We have a second root where w effective crosses this energy value right here. We'll call that root r0. Now this is a cubic in 1 over r, so there should be three roots. And the third root, root occurs for negative values of r. So if we plot w effective for negative r, you can see here for negative r this the negative value minus r is positive. So this is a combination of 1 over r squared and 1 over r cubed. 
type uh, curves. So it looks something like this. And we have a third root right here, which we'll call R minus. Recall that the effective energy of this particle can't be too large, or else the pulse of light will just run into the surface of the sun. So with this energy well below the peak of the potential, these two roots are widely separated, and in particular this root R0 is much less than R plus. This is a small root. And for R small, we have here uh, 1 over R squared and 1 over R cubed terms that dominate over the constant 1 over B squared. So this root, R0, can be approximated by dropping the 1 over B squared term. Now if we do that and set the um, denominator here equal to 0, we find that the root is just R equal 2M, the value of R that makes this factor vanish. So R0 is approximately 2M. Our strategy now will be the same strategy we used in analyzing the orbital motion. We'll factor out this root 2m from the denominator. So we have this polynomial, which is under the square root. It's equal to 1 over b squared minus 1 minus 2m over r divided by r squared. And we'll factor out the root 2m. So we'll factor that out as 1 minus 2m over r, which indeed has the 0 at r equal 2m. And that's equal to 1 over b squared times 1 minus 2m over r inverse minus 1 over r squared. And now we'll expand this factor of 1 over 1 minus 2m over r inverse in a series. So this is 1 over b squared times 1 plus 2m over r plus higher order terms that we'll ignore because we know m over r is small, minus 1 over r squared. Let's simplify this. We have 1 minus 2m over r times 1 over b squared plus 2m over b squared times 1 over r minus 1 over r squared. So this is a quadratic in 1 over r, and we can solve it just using the quadratic formula. 1 over r equals minus this coefficient minus 2m over b squared plus or minus the square root of 2m over b squared quantity squared minus 4 times this coefficient, which is minus 1, so that flips this minus to a plus, times this 1 over b squared. All of that divided by 2 times this coefficient, so that's minus 2. So now let's simplify this. We have the roots are m over b squared plus or minus the 2 squared here is 4. Bring it out of the square root and it cancels this 2. So this is m squared over b to the fourth plus 1 over b squared. We can pull out m squared over b to the fourth from the square root and write this result as m over b squared times 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 plus b squared over m squared. And now we see the positive root is 1 over r plus equals m over b squared times 1 plus the square root of 1 plus b squared over m squared. And the negative root is 1 over r minus is m over b squared times 1 minus the square root of 1 plus b squared over m squared. So now we see that we can write the expression under the square root as a product of three factors, 1 minus 2m over r, 1 over r minus 1 over r plus, and 1 over r minus minus 1 over r where r minus and r plus are given explicitly in these expressions. So now our change in angle, phi final minus phi initial, is equal to minus 2 times the integral from infinity to r plus of dr divided by r squared times the square root 
of 1 minus 2m over r times 1 over r minus 1 over r plus times 1 over r minus minus 1 over r. We can simplify this by, first of all, flipping the limits of integration, r plus to infinity, and dropping this minus sign. And we'll also uh, take this factor of square root of 1 minus 2m over r, and since we know m over r is very small, we'll expand that in a series. So what we have is dr over r squared, then 1 plus m over r plus higher order terms that we'll ignore, divided by the square root of 1 over r minus 1 over r plus times 1 over r minus minus 1 over r. Now we change integration variables. We'll let u equal 1 over r, so du is equal to minus 1 over r squared dr. So then the change in angle is 2 times the integral from 1 over r plus to 0. dr over r squared is du, and there's a minus sign. And this factor in the numerator is 1 plus m times u. And in the denominator, we have the square root of u minus 1 over r plus and the square root of 1 over r minus minus u. This integral can be computed exactly. The result is 2m times the square root of minus 1 over r minus times 1 over r plus plus 4 plus 2m times 1 over r plus plus 1 over r minus times arc tangent of minus 1 over r plus divided by 1 over r minus. And now we plug in our values for r plus and r minus. I'll remind you 1 over r plus or r minus is equal to 1 over m over b squared times 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 plus b squared over m squared. Inserting those values for r plus and r minus, we find the change in angle is equal to 2m over b plus 4 times 1 plus m squared over b squared times arc tangent of the square root of 1 plus m squared over b squared plus m over b. So our final result for the deflection angle depends on the mass of the central body and the impact parameter b. If we want to compute the deflection of light by our sun, we need to take m equal to the mass of the sun, and the impact parameter needs to be larger than the radius of the sun, or else the light pulse will just run into the surface of the sun. So that means m over b, which is really gm over c squared b, needs to be less than g times the mass of the sun divided by c squared times the radius of the sun. And that number is about 2 times 10 to the minus 6. So m over b in this expression is a small quantity, so we can write our result for the change in angle as a series expansion in m over b. And the leading order term in that expansion will be obtained by just setting m over b equal to 0. So if we set m over b equal to 0, our change in angle is equal to 0 plus 4 times 1 times arc tangent of, this is just 1. Now the arc tangent of 1 is pi over 4, so this is just pi, which is the expected result. This is the Newtonian result. for the change in angle. Now the full result for the series expansion to linear order in m over b is phi f minus phi i equals pi plus 4 times m over b. So this term, 4m over b, is the correction to the Newtonian result, and this is the deflection angle.
So let's assume the impact parameter is as small as possible, approximately the radius of the sun, so the light is just grazing past the surface of the sun. Then we saw before that m over b is about 2 times 10 to the minus 6. So this is about 8 times 10 to the minus 6 radians. And now we can convert this to degrees and then to arc seconds. Remember, an arc second is 1 60th of 1 60th of a degree. So the final result is that the deflection angle is about 1.7 arc seconds. One of the first experimental tests of general relativity was a measurement of this deflection of light as it passed by the sun. In 1919, scientists traveled to South America and Africa and observed the starlight passing by the sun during a total solar eclipse. So here's the sun, here's a star, the earth, and the starlight as it passes by the sun is deflected. And the reason for doing this experiment during a solar eclipse is so that the bright light of the sun is blocked by the moon and that allows the instruments on Earth to be able to see the starlight as it grazes past the sun. The deflection angle is the difference between this incoming light and the direction the light would be coming in to the Earth if the sun weren't there. So this is the deflection angle, the 1.7 arc seconds. By the way, the direction of this incoming light in the absence of the sun's presence was known because this star was chosen to be one whose position was accurately measured relative to other stars on the celestial sphere. So, for example, here are some other stars, and when this star is observed during the solar eclipse, it appears to be coming from this position. So the scientists could see that this star's position on the celestial sphere had shifted relative to these other stars. And that shift in position is just determined by this deflection angle. In the last few minutes of this lecture, I'd like to return to the thought experiment discussed at the beginning, where we argued that a pulse of light traveling across a rocket ship will follow a curved path. So here's the rocket ship. The engines are firing as the rocket hovers above the surface of Earth. Of course, the results would be the same if the rocket ship were just sitting on the surface of the Earth, but with the engines firing, it reminds us that the rocket is accelerating upwards. So according to our argument, which was based on the principle of equivalence, the light will follow a curved path as it crosses the rocket ship. In this case, I'd like to argue that there's an objective, quantitative sense in which the light is bent by the presence of the mass m without making any reference to the asymptotically flat region far away from this mass. And so this situation is different from our calculation of the deflection of light around the sun. In that case, the asymptotically flat region played a key role in the analysis. But what we can do in this case is use the property that the Schwarzschild spacetime is static. Now, a static space-time is any space-time that contains a time-like killing vector field so the integral curves of the killing vector field are time-like world lines. And furthermore, the killing vector field is orthogonal to a stack of time slices. In more concrete terms, what it means for a spacetime to have a time-like killing vector field 
is that there exists a set of coordinates such that the metric components g mu nu are independent of one of those coordinates of one coordinate, say, coordinate t. And this coordinate t, the coordinate lines are time-like. So the killing vector field is the basis vector d by dt. Now what it means to say that the killing vector field is orthogonal to a stack of time slices is just telling us that the inner product between the killing vector field and any of one of the other basis vectors vanishes. So the inner product between d by dt and let's let the other basis vectors be d by dxi, so the other coordinates are x sub i. It's just telling us that this is zero. And this inner product, of course, is just g0i, or if you like, gti. So if we put all this together, we find that the metric for a static space-time has the form a zero, zero component, which only depends on um, the spatial coordinates, not on the coordinate t. These off-diagonal components are zero, and then here we have a three by three block, which we're denoting g i j, and again these only depend on the spatial coordinates, not on the coordinate t. We can now view this static space-time as a stack of space-like slices so uh, or draw the picture this way here's one t equal constant slice here's another and so forth so each one of these slices is, for example, this is t equals 1, the coordinate t. Here's t equal 2, t equal 3, and so forth. So each one of these slices is the spatial geometry with, with the metric g i j. And because the space-time is static, the geometry of each one of these slices is precisely the same as the geometry for every other slice. So each of these slices is a three-dimensional geometry with metric gij. Now let me draw a null geodesic through the space-time. So this is a null geodesic. So it's the path of a photon or a pulse of light. So what does it mean to say that this light bends? So is it bent? Well, we can imagine taking this stack of slices and squashing them into a single slice. So we'll squash these into a single slice. And the points, the events that define this null geodesic, we can just carry them down to the single slice as we com collapse this stack. So this would be the path of the light in space. And this is a sensible procedure, squashing all of these uh, space-like slices together precisely because they have the same geometry, gij. And that just comes from the fact that the space-time is static. And now that we've defined the path of the light in space, we can ask, is this a straight line? Now keep in mind that what's meant by a straight line in a three-dimensional space is a space like geodesic. So we can take two points, say here and here, and we can 
ask for the space-like geodesic between these two points. So maybe it looks like this. So this is a space-like geodesic. So it's the path that minimizes the distance between these two points. It would be the same path taken by a stretched elastic cord. And so what we're asking here is, does this path in space of the light coincide with this space-like geodesic? So this is what we need to do to analyze the path of light near Earth or near any massive body. First step is to consider a null geodesic in the static Schwarzschild space-time. So the null geodesic would be a world line x mu of lambda, where lambda is an affine parameter. And using Schwarzschild coordinates, this is t of lambda, r of lambda, theta of lambda, and phi of lambda. The next step we look at the path of the light in a space-like slice. So that's just given by r of lambda, theta of lambda, and phi of lambda. Then the next step is to compare this path to a geodesic a geodesic in the three-dimensional space-like slice. So the three-dimensional space-like slice has the metric 1 minus 2m over r inverse dr squared plus r squared d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared. And the space-like geodesic would be um, some curve xi of s, so xi are the spatial coordinates r, theta, and phi, and the geodesic is parameterized by proper distance s. So this would be some curve in space r of s, theta of s, and phi of s. So the comparison is between this path and this path, this path defining a straight line, and this path defining the motion of the light through space. I won't go through the details of the calculation here, but leave it as a practice problem. It's a fun calculation. You should try it.